Chapter 22, The Earth Pony Way. I pray for the safety of all good ponies who come to Philadelphia, even slaves. But we can't expect the goddess to do all the work. Industry. Spike had said he didn't understand the Earth Pony Way until he had seen Philadelphia. Even now, with the ruins of the city looming on the edge of the horizon, I began to understand why. Industry had been the secret heart of Equestria since long before the war. How could you have pony-pulled trains without steel mills crafting metal for the rails? How could you have the tall skyscrapers of Manhattan without glass companies producing windows by the hundreds? How could a small town like Ponyville have a dressmaker's shop without all the finest fabrics, without the textiles industry? Still, most ponies had barely thought about it. Out of sight, out of mind. Living in the idyllic pastoral towns and high clan cities of Equestria, it had been easy forgotten. Unless you were a pony living in Equestria's single center for manufacturing, a mecca of earth pony industry, Philadelphia. I learned these things from Steel Hooves. I had sought his knowledge when it became abundantly clear that we were heading towards something far more than just a really big version of Old Appaloosa. Because less than halfway between Manhattan and Philadelphia, my pitbuck had started picking up a broadcast out of Philadelphia. It was the same musical programming the Sprite Bots kept playing, interrupted occasionally for messages from Red Eye. But now, I had an almost constant feed. I realized that those little speeches were far more frequent and carried more substance than I had assumed. Now, Roddy was able to talk to me as he did the ponies of Philadelphia, and his words worried me a lot. We have Uncle and Aunt Fruit Cup, a peaceful and lovely couple, married for nearly a decade now living in their quaint little house with their teeny garden on the outskirts of Romer. No children, two dogs, and a sunflower that Aunt Fruit Cup has named Celestia. What kind of monster, I have been asked, would root up Aunt and Uncle Fruit Cup, tear them away from their peaceful, pointless lives, and set them to work hauling carts heavy with scrap metal? A monster, indeed. But, one with his eyes open, and cast upon our future. The future of Equestria. Two hundred years ago, we lost our great nation, but we will have it again. And what would the fruit cups and their little homestead be in two hundred years? Nothing. Meaningless. Not even hoof notes in the annals of history. But what will have meaning two hundred years from now? This factory. And it's from this factory, and the others like it, that Equestria will be rebuilt. It is from the work that Uncle and Aunt Fruit Cup do now that the new national infrastructure will be created, and a new golden age will be born. The golden age of unity. Equestria will rise like a phoenix from her own ashes. But not without our help and not without our labor. This is what is important. This will make a difference. This will last. The words of Red Eye were met by the clopping applause of at least a hundred hooves. The roar of the crowd was abruptly cut off, replaced by a gravelly voice. And there you have it, Red Eye's speech marking the reopening ceremony of the Hornet Steel Factory. Word has it, Red Eye will be making a return visit later this week to inspect the factory's output. For now, have some music, starting with my favorite, March of the Paris Brights. The broadcast began playing the familiar marching music, heavy on tuba and harmonica. I turned off the station, pulling out my ear bloom. Red Eye 
it would seem, didn't live in Philadelphia. But he made visits, and one was coming up very soon. I informed my companions of this. Velvet Remedy was curled up on one of the bench seats of the Sky Bandit, with Pyrelight sleeping next to her, a glowing patch of emerald and gold against her charcoal coat. I was amazed at how the Balefire Phoenix had stayed with her. Normally, even a pet bird would need a cage. Steelhoofs nodded, not turning towards me. He had been keeping watch on the ground, sweeping below us ever since we had flown over the last rubble of the Manhattan suburbs. I tried to avoid doing that. I have bad news, folks, Clemity called from the front of the Sky Bandit. She's starting to sag. Keep your peepers out for some place to put her down long enough to swap out the spark batteries. All I've got is dirt, rocks, and dead trees, Steelhoose called back. Nothing you want to land down out here. I float out of the binoculars and move to the edge of one of the windows, braving the possible vertigo. What are we looking for? Steelhoose continued to scan the ground below. Any place the hellhounds are less likely to get at us. Hellhounds. I recalled homage as DJ Pwn3, warning ponies about hellhounds in the stretch between Manhattan and Philadelphia. I'd been picturing rabid dogs, like the ones Uncle and Aunt Fruit Cup had, only vicious. Possibly overgrown and mutated, like the Bloodwings. Sure, the first time I heard of a hellhound, I learned that just one could take out a wagon train of slavers. But then, so could I. And I was hardly fighting. Frightening. Steelhoof's even voice, however, betrayed a hint of worry. And nothing my mind had been conjuring would even strike alarm in the ancient steel-clad soldier. What are hellhounds? I caught a slight shiver pass through Pyrelight. I suspected the answer would be something much worse than I dismissed them to be. Then, even the nigh-immortal bird is worried. The suspicion was nailed home when Steelhoofs and Calamity both turned to look at me as if I had just asked what a gun was. You don't know what a hellhound is? Steelhoofs asked evenly. And you decided we should go to Philadelphia anyway without finding out what lies between. Love Remedy chimed in. I've never heard of a hellhound. Steelhoof's face hoofed, with a clank of metal on metal. Calamity muttered something about stable folk from ahead. You could fill us in, Velvet Remedy suggested, or you two can just keep being melodramatic. Steelhoof's bristled. The hellhounds, he nickered, are simply the most dangerous creatures in the equestrian wasteland. I'd rather face off against alicorns. Velvet Remedy and I exchanged looks. She deadpanned. Wow, informative. What? Are these things a secret? I smirked. Clemente pushed back his hat, glancing over at us at his left wing. Either y'all folks ever heard about Splendid Valley? My yes came simultaneously with Velvet Remedy's no. While hellhounds had not struck much of a note in my imagination, a terrifying specter of Splendid Valley had been painted in my mind by all the dark rumors and foreboding mentions of the place. I looked down and over the ruined plains below, all brown dirt and blackened trees. It didn't look like the barren landscape in the picture in Twilight's Atheum, but that had been before the end of the world. It could be. Is that what is that what's between Manhattan and Philadelphia? Splendid Valley? Are we over right now? I scanned for what could be Maripony. A structure in the distance caught my eye. A large building topped with smokestacks. It looked fairly intact. Giant metal skeletons fanned out from the building in all directions, holding up lines of cable. Clemity barked a laugh. Oh, hell no! Splendid Valley's closer to Ponyville than Philadelphia. I was suddenly thankful for the slavers who captured me my first night out, out of the stable. Without them, 
what pony could say the direction I would struck off in. But, what do y'all know about Splendid Valley? Well, that's where Maripony is, I started, trying to remember everything I had heard, all while wondering where Calamity was leading us to with this. Stuhus was silent, which could mean he thought that Calamity was talking on the right track. Or just that Steel Hooves was Steel Hooves. Maripony used to be there because of all the gemstones they mined out of Splendid Valley, but it was converted into something else once the gems were all gone. I licked my lips, trying to think more. They stored all sorts of magical toxins in the caves underneath Splendid Valley, and it was the second place hit by a mega spell. Second place, huh? Calamity whined. I didn't know that. You're missing the most important thing, Steelers interrupted. More important than mega spells, radiation, and magical toxins? I looked from Calamity to Steel Hooves. Yep. When the ponies decided to mine Splendid Valley, they had one small problem. The valley was inhabited. Velvet Remedy's eyes widened. Wait. They mined ponies' homes? Not ponies, Steelhoofs answered, interjecting. Gemstones meant magical energy weapons, crucial for the war effort. It was decided that the creatures living in Splendid Valley had to move. The valley belonged to the nation of Equestria, and it was needed. I felt a rock growing in my stomach. Only, not all of the inhabitants seemed to get the message. And after ponies had been stripped clean of the place, several families moved back into those caverns. Back in to where the Ministry of Arcane Sciences was storing hazardous medical, uh, magical waste. And to where the zebras set off a balefire bomb, Stilhoofs added. Goddesses, Velvet Remedy gasped. And they survived? Those poor, what were they again? Diamond dogs, Calamity called back. I froze. Wait. Hold on. Are you telling us that the creatures that Rary defeated by whining have become the most terrifying monsters in the equestrian wasteland? Yep. I looked at Steel Hooves in disbelief, but his helmet nodded. They're big, they're fast, and they're extremely aggressive. They have claws that can tear through armor like it was soft cloth. I've seen one claw on their way through an Olicorn's magical shield. Fuck. Well, makes me glad we're up here where we can shoot at them and they can't get at us. I paused. They can't fly, can they? Nope, Calamity said, much to my short-lived relief. But they can dig. Fast and pretty much through anything. When they come after you, they can stay underground till they're right beneath you. Ground might tremble a bit, but that's all the warning you'll get before they rend you apart. And they sure ain't gonna stand around outside where you can shoot at them. Worse, Steelhoofs asserted, they're smart. These aren't animals like manticores or blood wings. They've gotten a hold of magical energy weapons Reverse engineered them, and rebuilt them for holding their claws. They don't have the magic to create new ones, but they sliced their way into Splendid Valley Armory and stole over a hundred weapons, all of which, we assume, had been repurposed. So, Velvet Remedy said slowly, they can shoot us, and we can't get them. Cocking her head towards me, she snarked. Well, thank you, little Pip. I adore the places you take me to. What is this place? I asked, staring at the huge smokestacks as I stepped out of the Sky Bandit and onto the broken roof of the building that I had spotted in the distance. All around, metal structures like the skeletons of standing giants stretched out across the plains, most marching towards Manhattan or Philadelphia. The building was huge, and offered the best protection against hellhounds. 
A power station, Steelhoofs answered. Massive furnaces burning coal to generate the power necessary to operate a lot of the non-magical conveniences that came out of Equestria's technological revolution. There were hundreds of these all over Equestria before the war. He pointed a hoof to the cables that the metal skeletons were holding up. Those carried the power created here to those cities. Wow. I floated out the binoculars and gazed out along one of the marching lines of metal structures. About a mile away, several had collapsed, the lines severed and dangling from their still standing compatriots. This was so much bigger than the once coal-powered train engines I had seen in New Appaloosa and Junction R7. Clemente detached himself from the Sky Bandit's harness and was preparing to crawl under the passenger wagon as well as Remedy fished spare spark batteries out of her saddlebags. Floating my binoculars back into my saddlebags, I cast a look at the roof. On one end was a small tower with a door. My curiosity woke up, and I began digging into my mind with a persistent hoof. Struggling, I strotted, started to trot towards this door, pulling out my screwdriver and bobby pin in anticipation. No reason not to just take a look. I was thrilled when the door unlocked. Crouching, I got to work. Click. Such a sweet sound. I nudged the door open. Stairs up to the tower and down to the power plant itself. As I stepped into the darkness, a deep, rumbling voice asked, Where are you going? Exploring, I smiled back. Steelhoofs just shook his head, but took up position behind me as I headed up the stairs. The tower stairwell opened up into a single room with a balcony that looked like it was designed for Pegasus wagon landings. The back half of the room was nothing more than a huge cargo elevator, a circular company logo painted on the elevator door. Hippocampus Energy, Hydroelectric Coal Sewage, was flaked and peeled into slow oblivion. The rest of the room had huge windows looking out towards Philadelphia and Manhattan skylines. Both were far enough away on the horizon that it hid them. But Philadelphia was closer, and I could see the clouds on the horizon hung low. Black, angry clouds, lit by reddish, reddish light from below. Philadelphia's ivory tower was clearly visible, slashing up into the clouds like a needle. Wow. The sky over Philadelphia actually looks kind of evil. Red Eye must have several of the factories going again, Steelhoofs commented. I nodded, although I had no idea why that would change the cloud cover. Then again, I thought as I looked out across the power plant's massive chimneys, maybe it would. There were four boxes of ammo sitting under a bank of dead lights with labels like generator number 11 output and sector number 7 load I knelt by the ammo boxes. Two were empty, and the other two locked. I opened one easily enough, retrieving ammo that didn't match any firearm I had seen before. A big and frightening caliber. The other box, to my surprise, was jammed. Somebody had tried to pick the lock and failed badly. It was literally the first evidence I had seen that any pony in the Equestrian Wishland other than myself had learned lock picking. Unfortunately for both of us, this pony wasn't very good at it. I sat back. I had no idea how to open a force jammed lock, aside from sort of a massive firepower that would likely destroy the contents of the armored box. The damn thing was designed so you couldn't just shoot the lock off. I telekinetically lifted the box and tried to pry at it, but that was utterly futile. A pony might think that having the strength to lift a train car would give me more than enough power to tear open a box, but no. The levitation field of my telekinesis makes the objects trapped inside, like the boxcar in Appaloosa, virtually weightless. Until, of course, I let it go. There simply wasn't enough force behind my single magical spell to break a lock. I'd have better luck with a crowbar, but I tried anyways, and failed. And tried again, and failed again. And finally tossed the box as hard as I could, it hit with a thud that had no further damage to the box left, but a small crack in the plaster covering the wall. 
Done now? A smooth, feminine voice asked from the stairwell. Or would you like to jump on it with your hooves for a while first? I blushed, looking at Velvet Remedy. Uh, how's Calamity doing? She sighed, looking out the window at the Sky Bandit on the roof below. Do you think there's any chance of getting him a bath in Philadelphia? She looked across at Steel Hooves. I suspect an actual spa is right out. I laughed. Good luck trying to get Calamity into a spa, even if there is one. A stairwell, I mean, the stairwell that led down to the offices adjacent to the break room. While Steel Hooves and I took the offices, Velvet Remedy trotted off towards the ladder to scavenge any foodstuffs from what had once been the employee refrigerator. I felt confident that everything she would find would be vegetarian, no matter the actual contents. The offices had windows on opposite sides. To the back, the windows had once peered outside, but they were so caked with dust over the centuries that the weakened sunlight that made it through clouds above was not strong enough to penetrate. Opposite those were windows that stared out over the power plant's main floor, filled with enormous generators and a wall full of furnaces. A small catwalk bisected the air above, leading from the offices here to what looked like an overmare's office at the far side. How did catwalks over heavy machinery become the dominant aesthetic? Horrifying memories of iron shot firearms were flashing through my head, although Fortunately, this place seemed utterly deserted. Looking around, I could see where there had been a turret emplacements, but they were destroyed. Further catwalks and suspended stairwells led down to the floor of the plant, and on one was the crumbling remains of a brain bot and a few piles of milk, milky pink ash. Further evidence of the scavengers who had come before us. I turned back already having decided to cross the catwalk, catwalk and explore the office beyond. But not with steel hooves. Previous experience told me that having someone as heavy as he was on those catwalks would be four hooves of no. Steel hooves was looking at a framed sheet higher up on another wall. A badly faded page from a newspaper stared back. I trotted over, having to plant my four hooves on the wall to get to the height to read it. The pony who hung it from the frame was not thinking of shorter ponies. The main article featured a picture of this power plant, or at least one that could be its identical sister. Hippocampus Energy Plant Number 12 opens amidst controversy. Pegasus and Unicorn protesters decry environmental impact. The story dominated the page, pushing aside lesser stories. Philadelphia's prestigious Alpha Omega Hotel to host this year's Summer Sun Celebration. And coal prices continue to rise as relations with Zebra Nation remain stained. Princess Celestia promises amiably to resolve the solution soon. To make room. A thought hit me. Back in New Appaloosa, Clemente had said something. All the coals in the strange, faraway lands, full of zebras. I dropped to all hooves, turning my head towards steel hooves. Hold on, I said, feeling dumbstruck for a second time in many hours. The question didn't have any coal. I waved a hoof at the power plant. Are you telling me you ponies built Equestria's entire infrastructure on a power source you didn't have? Steelhoof said nothing. That's insane! What pony does that? Steelhoof just stared as I mentally melted down trying to phrase that idea. Finally, he stated, why would that be a problem? We had the resources the zebras needed, and they had coal. We trade. Everyone's happy. Yeah, sure. Until some pony, or zebra, figures out that they don't have enough to go around anymore, or decides they just don't want to share. I turned away, my eyes falling on a desk, and the strangely pristine coffee mug still sitting on it. I allowed myself the distraction 
of marveling at how, in all these dusty, tattered, and decaying ruins, a coffee mug would be the thing in finest condition. I glanced across at the other desks and a table beyond. Yes, there wasn't one that I wouldn't have felt safe drinking out of, except for the one where a baby red roach had apparently decided to drown itself. I shuddered a little, and decided that the coffee mug maker had employed some minor magic in its creation. A little spell meant to keep them from being stained by the coffee had left them the cleanest things in all of Equestria. Several of the mugs had the company emblem. Hippocampus Energy, Hydroelectric Coal, Sewage... Okay, so Equestria hadn't been entirely dependent on trade with zebras, but this power plant spoke volumes to just how much they needed it. I snorted in weary amusement. Unicorns gave us power through magic. Earth ponies had given us power through water, rocks, and... Oh, horse apples, I said, suddenly realizing why we all had left Calamity on the rooftop alone. We all galloped back, only to find Calamity still at work. Shouldn't be more than a few minutes, he said, half his body hidden under the sky bandit. Why? What's got y'all oxen so spooked? Pyrolat was circling overhead, keeping an eye out for danger, or food, or small shiny things. Nothing, Steelhu started to reply, but Velvet Remedy stepped forward, levitating a rolled sheet of paper as she had slipped through the straps of her saddlebags. I found something I wanted wanted you to have a look at. Velvet almost purred. Building and fixing things is your forte, after all. Calamity pushed himself out from under the Sky Bandit to take a look. Velvet Remedy cringed back slightly. He was as filthy as she had feared. Sure, what you got for me? Taking a few steps back from Calamity, Velvet floated the roll of paper between them, uncurling the schematic. The paper was darkly stained with blood, but most of the writing was still legible, and Calamity leaned forward to study it. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Pyrolite dive down below the roof line. A moment later, there was a crackle of green flame. The majestic predator returned with a roasted squirrel in her beak. She dropped it on the roof next to Velvet Remedy, and began pecking at it. I boggled internally, as Velvet who had not minutes ago edged back from the dirt and grease-smeared calamity, only smiled at the very carnivorous actions of the Balefire Phoenix. Calamity let out a low whistle. Well, some pony was sure inventive. He looked up to Velvet Remedy. Where'd y'all find this? On a table, beneath the remains of a dead unicorn pony, Velvet Remedy fretted. I could guess by the waver in her voice that the body had not been a skeleton. Some pony more recent, one of the scavengers, I assumed. I think she may have died for that. How'd she die? Calamity asked, with an odd sense of urgency. Velvet Remedy, ever the medical pony, was swift to answer. She was hit by a magical weapon. I didn't turn it didn't turn over to ash, but it melted half of her face and neck. She said grimly. Calamity nodded with a frown. Well, that rules out about nothing. The power plant had a robotic sentry that wielded magical energy weapons, I informed him. I've seen the sword before. Calamity let out a sigh of relief. Pyrolite looked up from her meal, a strip of barbecued squirrel dangling from her beak. This here's a design for creating a helmet using the claws of a hellhound. Thing is, I don't think a unicorn could use it, he told us. I could imagine why. I had no desire to trade my horn for such a helmet. But it would sure make one hell of a weapon if I ever gave up shooting for headbutton. One of the children asked me, Red Eye, what's your cutie mark? The charismatic voice of Red Eye spoke to me in my ear bloom as I moved back down into the power plant. This time, I left Steel Hooves behind with Calamity. In return, 
Velvet Remedy insisted on accompanying me. No splitting up. To that child, I answered, I don't have one. I paused, living a hoof to my ear below. I recalled with a shudder how the alicorns were blank flanked. Was Red Eye an alicorn? He certainly didn't speak like one. I racked my brain, trying to remember if I'd ever encountered a male alicorn. I couldn't think of one. Of course, the next question was, why, Red Eye? Why don't you have a cutie mark? Because I chose not to have a cutie mark. Why would I want one? Am I really going to let a picture on my flank determine my future? If I find something that I really enjoy, do I need an icon on my ass to tell me? Of course not. Too, too many ponies. Cutie marks are more about what you can't be. How can you expect to be a great scientist if your cutie mark is a rake? Or an amazing artist if your flank has a picture of a pile of hay? Who is going to give you the chance? But, if your flank is bare, then the possibilities are endless, and the choice is up to you. That is why I had my cutie mark removed, and that is why children of unity have chosen the same. In the new Equestria, we will all be lifted up by the goddess, freed from the shackles of cutie mark coercion. But then there is still much work to be done before that day. So, in anticipation for it, we have chosen to take the first step ourselves. I took my first step onto the catwalk, and I shut off the broadcast. I didn't need any more of that nonsense threatening to threatening my concentration if a section of the catwalk started to give way. Velvet, you stay here. I'm going to go up ahead to that office, because that's what not splitting up means to you, right? Velvet Shine. I sighed and tapped at the catwalk. Because I don't want to risk putting extra weight, I climbed up two words too late. So, you're saying that I'm heavy? Velvet Remedy said with a voice like chocolate silk. Is that why you no longer seem attracted to me? And here I thought it was because of the wagon. But no, it's because you think I'm fat. I face hoofed. Velvet, I. Oh no, she said, putting an extra s sway into her hips as she stepped onto the catwalk in front of me. It's good that you finally told me. All this adventuring, and I've really let myself go, haven't I? Velvet. The more mature unicorn mare tossed her mane as she turned to look at me over her shoulder, pouting alluringly. I felt a flush of arousal mixed with cringing shame. She lifted a hoof to her muzzle, sucking it, sucking it in thought. I suppose I'm getting too old. Luna's tittle mare meat. I began to follow behind her, head hung low, using my levitation to keep most of my own weight off the catwalk. She tortured me the whole trip. It was the longest catwalk in history. I was working on the lock of the door to what I had mentioned and labeled as the power plant's Overmare office when Velvet Remedy bit my armored utility barding and gave a tug. My mind immediately conjured two possibilities. Either something was wrong, the sort of wrong that required silent notification, or, Velvet Remedy had decided to ramp up my punishment with nuzzles and nips. Either, really, seemed just as likely. I heard a scuffling noise below. Okay, not a punishment. Carefully, I set down my tools, not wanting to risk a shock making me drop them. I peered over the edge of the catwalk, and below us, hidden behind the last, of the massive generators was the shredded body of a steel ranger. Gasping in horror, I almost cried out Steelhoof's name, but this wasn't Steelhoof's. The armor had subtle differences to the design, which told me this ranger had been a mare. Lumbering over to the corpse 
was a hulking demonic creature. Canine, only in the broadest comparison. Three times the size of the armored pony, whom it was tearing to ribbons with deadly claws that sliced through the armor like a paper mache. The hellhound stopped, sniffing at the air. It raised itself to its full height, and then let out a pained howl, dropping back to all fours again. One of the creature's legs was crippled and deformed. The steel ranger had gotten in one good hit before falling to the monster. The monster reached over and picked up a bizarrely designed magical rifle from the floor. Again, it began to look around. Velvet Remedy crouched flat against the catwalk, and I shied away from the edge. We held our breaths. We heard a grunt, then a whimper, and shuffling. It was moving, but to where? I carefully lifted the screwdriver and bobby pin again, hoping that this office offered a back way out. I didn't want to crawl back across the catwalk. If it could smell us, I wanted out of this room quickly. The tumblers fell into place, and the door opened with a click that felt deafening. We both heard the odd vocal sound from somewhere below. We both rushed into the room as quickly as we could, and I gently pushed the door closed behind us. But it was too late. I could see the monster climbing one of the sets of stairs like a monkey. If that monkey were made out of death. I looked immediately to the wall, where the elevator had been in iron shod firearms. No such luck. I took in the room quickly. Desk. Terminal. Wall. Weapons cabinet. A weapons cabinet in a power plant? Filing cabinet. Office fridge. Miscellaneous badly decayed furniture. No other exit at all. I figured it would take the hellhound all of seconds to claw through the door. It would take longer with this bad leg to get across the catwalk. Velvet Remedy galloped to the far corner, horn beginning to glow. Damn it. If these things could claw through an alicorn shield, what good would velvets do? I floated out little Macintosh and my sniper rifle. Although, it would have only the slimmest chance of getting a shot off with a ladder before the monster closed the distance and killed me. We waited. As the seconds dragged on, I started counting the missed opportunities to swap out ammunition for something with more punch. But as much as I yearned to do so, I was certain the moment I emptied Little Macintosh would be the moment the Hellhound came through the door. Velvet Remedy was trembling, tensely holding her spell. She was shooting me furtive looks that I couldn't interpret, but didn't dare even whisper. We waited several more seconds. By my estimation, the Hellhound should have already reached the door. Was it just sitting outside, or had it gone away? I forced myself to think through the clouding effect of fear. She loves to said these things were smart. Could it be planning? What would it be planning? What would I plan if I was the incarnation of death? A wounded one. What I wouldn't do is charge through the door where the ponies on the other side were waiting to shoot me. No. I'd set a trap. It was setting a trap! Mine had snatched the idea when Velvet whispered in one of my ears. It tracks by scent, she hissed. What if it went the wrong way? I didn't think that was likely. It must have heard me shut the door behind us. Even if Velvet Remedy was right, that man was headed up towards Steel Hoops and Calamity. And we were wasting precious seconds that we didn't have. Of course, if I was right, rushing out to save them would be exactly the trap springing mistake it was looking for. Cautiously, I inched towards the door. I was nearly to it when I heard the sound from somewhere on the other side of it. Faint, and brief, and unfathomable. I jumped, backpedaling, until I hit my tail against the far wall. I crouched, cowering, and readied my weapons to shoot. All of them. With a sense of utter dread, I grew tired of waiting. My nerves were frazzled from adrenaline. 
The room's musty, dilapidated odor was giving me a headache. I thought I had heard the strange sounds a few more times, but it was so faint through the door that it could just as easily have been the whispers of my mind playing tricks on me. By now, if the monster had already gone after Steel Hooves and Calamity, they were already dead. If it was stalking us, it was clearly willing to wait forever. Fine, I hissed. I'm going to find out what we're going to die for, and then I'm leaving. Slow and careful. I'm expecting a trap. Velvet Remedy nodded. Just keep the hellhound... Just keep out of the hellhound's way. I've got a plan. Velvet Remedy had a plan? Velvet? I quickly chided myself for being so surprised. She was smart and capable, if not exactly what I considered wasteland wise. And besides, it was bound to happen sooner or later. I started with a weapons locker, only to find that, like the ammo upstairs, the lock had been mangled by an amateurish lockpicking attempt. I felt a flare of hatred. She lives in Calamity might be dead, we might be about to die, and this idiot had fucked up the lock. I moved on to the desk, only to find it had been unlocked and emptied. The filing cabinet had been unlocked as well, but inside, I found mostly ashes, with the burnt remains of documents and folders, as well as partially melted audio recorders, with no recording remaining. My rival lockpicker had opened this filing cabinet with the intent to destroy the contents, not loot them. I turned to the terminal. Hacking it was hard, but not as hard as Pinkie Pie's terminal. Either way, my rival had gotten into it before me. Or the terminal spell matrix had been programmed to wipe out all of its contents. The terminal is blank. That left the wall safe, which I had purposely left for last. Looking it over, I had to buy back a whistle at the craftsmanship. The lock was, by far, the most complicated and demanding I have ever attempted, not to mention the sturdiest. The rival had clearly attempted to try and failed here too, but the lock resisted even jamming. The bitch had responded by breaking off a bobby pin in a mean attempt to prevent me from getting the prize I had denied her. I pulled it out with simple telekinesis. My first attempt failed, as did my second. I thought I had it the third time, but was only rewarded with a broken bobby pin. Damn it! I wasn't sure if, with all the benefits of party time mentals, I could manage it. No, I wasn't going down that path. Not again. Instead, I pulled out every lockpicking tool I had at my disposal and tried again, and again, and again, until finally, I got it right. The safe clicked open. Inside was a fair amount of pre-war gold coins, two clips of those very scary bullets, a stealth buck, and a memory orb, and a golden iron pony saddle buckle. If it's an iron pony buckle, why is it colored gold? That last, I left behind. Motioning Velvet Remedy behind a desk, I crouched down and focused on the door. A telekinetic field enveloped the door, depressing the handle with a click and pulling it open. The first thing I saw was the Hellhound crouched at the far end of the walkway, holding its rifle as it tracked the target I couldn't see. The first thing I heard was the symphony of beeps as the magical energy mines that the hellhound had attached to the door prepared to detonate. Beep, 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 beep. My instinct was slammed to slam the door shut. Even if the blacklash didn't kill us, the explosion would destroy the bridge. Instead, I grasped each of them with my telekinesis and shot a prayer to the goddess that the actual strength of my spell was enough to pry them off the door. The Hellhound turned and fired a beam of orange light at me. It struck inside the wall safe, scorching the back. The energy splash turned the Iron Pony buckle brightly hot. 
The damn mines wouldn't budge. The Hellhound might as well have attached them with Wonder Glue. And, in retrospect, probably did. Beep, beep, beep. There was no more time. I slammed the door and ducked. The explosion melted the wall. It also turned enough of the floor into goo that the desk fell into the room below us. Without thinking about it, Velvet and I leaped down after it. The last thing I saw, that I thought I saw, before I plunged into the darkness below, was pyrelight soaring across the wide open space above the generators, the hellhound trying to track her with its rifle. The last thing I heard was the rendering sound of metal. Pain laced up my left forehoof with every step. Considering what we had momentarily escaped, I was happy for it. I had merely twisted my hoof. I still had all my libs attached. The hallway led past bathrooms on one side, and what I suspected was a supervisor's barrack room, complete with a vending machine. The opposite side of the hallway bore a set of three framed and backlit posters, each with a different illustration, but the same proclamation in brig, bold letters. PROGRESS! The highly stylized image were, in order, a train engine bellowing smoke and hauling multiple passenger cars by itself, ponies staring at the metal, staring up in marvels at the monorail train passing overhead, and a mare marveling at in neurogasmic glee as her spider-like hover robot dusted her furniture. The last poster's black light was flickering mattingly. We found two more slashed apart steel rangers before we made it to the stairwell. To my dismay, the only way out was back into the generator room. Velvet Remedy whispered to me, When I say the word, gallop for all you're worth. The shot of fear went through my breast. I don't know if I can run right now, I said, but my real fear was that her plan was self-endangering. Try self-levitating just enough that you aren't putting any real weight on your hurt hoof, she recommended. And don't worry, I know that look. I'll be right behind you. Promise. Honestly, the pony in my head reminded me. It was not Velvet's, vir Velvet's virtue. You better be, or I'm coming back. She nodded. I had little Macintosh in front of me, now loaded with magically enhanced bullets. I took a breath. We stepped cautiously out into the main floor of the Hippocampus Energy Plant number 12. We were able to spot the injured Hellhound almost immediately. It was perched on top of a generator, shooting a pyre light, who in turn was twirling and dancing in the air, occasionally sending puffs of green flame at the monster's direction. Pyrelight was distracting it for us. Belatedly, I realized that those odd sounds I had been hearing were shots from the magical energy rifle, muffled by the door. Notes to self. First, Pyrolite is willing to risk herself for Velo Remedy, and possibly myself as well. Second, Pyrolite is an amazingly agile flyer. Third, Hellhounds may be 50 different flavors of murder, but they aren't necessarily good shots. The Hellhound took less than a second to notice our presence, leaping savagely at us, bloodthirsty claws outstretched. It gave a slight yelp as its ruined leg hit the floor, but its good leg pushed it toward us at a speed that caught me off guard. I froze, forgetting to fire. The light around Velvet Remedy's horn pulled away, becoming a ball of light that soared towards the Hellhound, striking it in the shoulder. The monster seemed to instantly lose all coordination, collapsing into a jumble of limbs, skidding towards us on the floor out of sheer momentum. Go! Velvet Remedy yelled as she started galloping, giving the monster a wide berth as she made for the far end, leaping over bits of the catwalk which had collapsed into the room. I followed, taking her suggestion. The pain still slowed me, but it was manageable. The hellhound slashed out at me with those huge, terrible claws, and I darted deftly out of the way. It tried to crawl after me, managing 
only a wicked slither. The hellhound had fallen, and couldn't seem to get up. Ahead of me, Velvet Remedy stopped, and motioned me to continue ahead. I worried, but didn't argue. As I reached the opposite stairwell, I heard a call out to Pyrelight behind me. Did you kill it? I asked, panting as hard as Pyrelight swooped into the Sky Bandit through a shattered window. Velvet Remedy galloped up just a pace behind. The charcoal-coated unicorn tossed herself into the passenger wagon. I'd arrived just ahead of them to yell warning to Steelhoofs and Calamity while gulping for breath. I think what I said amounted to, Ah, Hellhound, Generators, Rifle, Velvet, Spell, Go, Go, Go! Calamity had barely gotten the, the harness on and attached when Velvet had dashed out onto the roof. Calamity spread his wings and with a firm beat pulled us off the roof and into the air. Velvet Remedy cocked her head at me, even as she caught her own breath. Killed it? Why ever would I do that? I'm not in the habit of killing my patients. Blink. It was a what now? An aesthetic spell, she smiled. And the poor thing was clearly in pain. I stared at Velvet, like she had completely split her bit. Plus, it does have the very helpful side effect of preventing the patient from running around. Very hard to do when you can't feel your legs, she smiled cleverly, her eyes twinkling. I fell to my haunches. Damn. That plan... Damn. Recovering a little. You didn't actually heal it, did you? Velvet rolled her eyes. I took that as a no. Personally, I would have killed it if I had realized it was virtually helpless. But in no way, I was happy that Velvet had not. I had been worried that the wasteland was robbing her of that compassion which made her so special. It had eluded her spirit and eroded it. There was no getting away from that. But it seemed good to see Velvet Remedy in a my Pinkie Pie sense was still there. Even if contempting those three steel rangers, I really disagreed with that particular decision. When did you learn to do that? I asked, amazed. Velvet tossed her mane and smiled. Back in Ten Pony Tower, while you were out, Dr. Helping Hoof had quite a nice selection of old Ministry of Peace medical spell spells for sale. Velvet smiled wistfully. Apparently, Fluttershy's ministry had a whole department of unicorn ponies dedicated to magical research. The pony in my head perked with alarm, but was ignored. You can buy spells? Velvet Remedy nickered. If by that you mean barter for tutelage, then yes. But Dr. Helping Hoof was an earth pony. Yes, Velvet patronized, but his assistant was a nice unicorn buck. Anyway, don't feel too bad. I doubt you've missed out on anything. All the teaching in the world won't help if you don't have a natural talent for the type of spell you are trying to learn. I'll never be able to cast lightning from my horn, or even to turn a rock into a top hat, or conjure a door out of thin air. No matter how many bottle caps I try to spend, or hours I try to learn, Entertainment and magical, medical spells are my gift. I tried not to visibly droop. Yeah. And mine is to do the same spell every single other unicorn can do. The first one we learn, and that's it. It was like having a pip buck as a cutie mark. The epitome of non-special. No. Velvet's voice chided. Your gift is to do that spell better than any pony else in at least 200 years. I gave her a weak but thankful smile. That did make it sound better. Sorry about this, Clemity said as he hung from the harness, wings drooping. The entire Sky Bandit was wrapped in the soft light of my levitation spell, glowing against the darkened sky as if drifting us slowly towards a freestanding section of the overpass three piers long. 
It looked pretty sturdy, and should be safe from hellhounds. A place to spend the night. No need to apologize, I insisted. Clement had been flying for hours on end, with only the stop at the Hippocampus Energy Plant for a break. I envied the Pegasus's endurance. I'm gonna get up and go, Calamity bemoaned. Just kinda got up and went. He looked out towards the standing chunk of overpass. You gonna make it that far? No sweat. Actually, much sweat. I was already beginning to feel the strain, and the overpass was at least half an hour away. I would have said there was no way I could hold us that long, but after all Calamity did, I'd be darned if I couldn't find the fortitude to take us any further. We moved across the sky with aching slowness. Still, I can't believe I fretted. I mean, the idea that you could barter for spells never even crossed my mind. I let out a sigh. I guess that explains why Velvet Remedy is our diplomat and master trader, and I'm a toaster repair pony. Calamity supplied when I was at a loss for words. I laughed and nodded. Pyrelight fluttered out and perched on the rust colored Pegasus's battle saddle, clapping onto it with her claws. She spread her wings and flapped, as if with my magic in play she could hope to pull the Sky Bandit herself. Drat! Calamity chuckled. Pretty soon, y'all won't need me for anything. My eyes widened in alarm. What? Don't say that. Well, it ain't past my attention that I've not been with ya on your adventures far more lately than I've been with ya. I opened my mouth to tell him that wasn't true, that was, and stopped, as the reality of the statement sank into me. Instead, Calamity, you're my closest and dearest friend, not including homage, I mentally added. You keep me strong, and you keep me from losing it. I will always need you. Sure, you say that now. And next adventure, we'll go together. You and me. I promise. The setting sun dipped below the cloud line, setting the clouds ablaze with brilliant orange and dark crimsons. The effect was magnified against the black clouds that hung over Philadelphia, turning the whole post-apocalypse city into a fiery hell. Damn! There were dark spots floating around over the city. We were close enough to make them out, but just barely. Calamity had spotted them too, and he asked me to float him the binoculars. He scanned the air between the silhouetted ruins of Philadelphia and the conflagrant sky. Ah, hell, he said, motioning for me to take a look myself. I floated the binoculars to my eyes and stared towards Philadelphia, seeing hundreds of molten fires in the black below. Chimneys poured out constant smoke. The dragonic skeleton of a massive roller coaster added an alien touch to the city skyline. The dark silhouette of Philadelphia town shot up towards the sky, following it with my gaze until I saw dozens of pink deriggables shaped like creepy smiley faces complete with ears and mane floating around the sky above the city ruins Pinkie Pie Balloons There's a name for them? Calamity gave a shudder Anyway, I was looking at what the ponies in those Pinkie Pie Balloons were packing We sure as hell ain't flying into there I looked again, turning up the magnification as high as it would go. I saw earth ponies attending mounted rifles, easily two ponies long, scoped, and terrifying. They were what my sniper rifle would be like when it was all grown up. Anti-machine rifles, Calamity informed me. I now had a very good idea of what my scary new bullets were supposed to be for. He was right. Taking the Pegasus pulled bomb anywhere near the skyline was a death sentence. From here on in, we walked. We'd be sneaking into Philadelphia on hoof, and I sincerely hoped we were out of Hellhound territory.
How did the much deified Princess Celestia and Princess Luna allow our lands to become like this? How did the mayors of ministries allow the greatest and most glorious nation in the world to die in balefire and agony? The answer is quite simple. Incompetence. For generations, the hard-working ponies of Equestria toiled to build this great land, and the leaders sat back and reaped the benefits. And not only them, but a great majority of ponies throughout the land. They enjoyed the fruits of hard labor without lifting a hoof themselves. They lay back, slept on clouds, idled their days away like parasites feeding on the sweat of the workers. Workers like you. Workers like me. They became selfish and lazy. And laziness, my little ponies, breeds stupidity. The destruction they brought down on us was, in a word, inevitable. They couldn't do any better, because they weren't any better. But today, we all work. And tomorrow, when our toil is done, we will step forward and be accepted into the loving embrace of the goddess and be transformed. And in the coming unity, we will all reap the rewards of our brows, together as equals. I shut off Red Eye's broadcast. Somehow, they always left me feeling twisted inside. He was unpleasantly convincing sometimes. A steady diet of his fodder, and I might find myself biting his poisonous apple. Calamity had collapsed from exhaustion the moment we touched down on the overpass and was snorting softly nearby. There were other vehicles up here, including a large Sunrise Sarsaparilla delivery wagon that had been heading towards Philadelphia, a faded painting of a smiling Celestia watching over has happy sarsaparilla drinkers adorning its side. A couple of camouflaged painted chariots were abandoned at the far edge, part of a military, military convoy, the rest of which was crushed and buried under the collapsed section of the overpass beyond. I wanted to poke around, explore, but I'd promised calamity. And while looking at the backs of a few wagons wasn't really an adventure, I was sure he'd be sore at me if I didn't wait for him. With good reason. Velvet Remedy was asleep as well, and Pyrelight was perched on her shoulder, plumage seeming to glow in the dying light. The Balefire Phoenix looked proud, and, if it wasn't my imagination, possessive. Steelhooves was on guard again. I didn't think I'd ever seen him sleep. Did ghouls even need sleep? So much I didn't know. I like you, I said, smiling to the mythical bird. Your... The word that came to mind was simple. But after my mistake with Velvet Remedy earlier, I was watching my choice of vocabulary. Straightforward. I don't have to worry about any hidden agendas or dark secrets with you. You watched us, dare I say, out of curiosity? If so, it is something we have in common. The Balefire Phoenix let out a pleasant whistle. Velvet Remedy helped you, and you decided to stay with her. Friendship, pure and uncomplicated. The Phoenix preened. You chose well, I added, looking to Velvet Remedy. She really is a very good, very special pony. I reached over and put a hoof on her flank, touching her cutie mark, a singing bird. Pyrelight scowled, giving a hoot back by a little burst of green flame. I picked up, Pipbuck briefly click clicked, then it was quiet again. I drew back my hoof with a laugh. Don't worry. I'm not a rival. She's all yours. A touch. Charging, I added. Maybe once, I would have been. But, things have changed. The green and gold phoenix cocked her head. I found a way to explain. Velvet put me in a cage. It was for my own good. And I, I was sick and hurting myself. But after that, I paused. 
We're just good friends. Pyrolite seemed satisfied with that, but I wasn't going to pet Bell Remedy's flank to find out. I was having trouble sleeping. The fright earlier and the worries of what lay ahead merged into a constant buzz in my head. I couldn't afford to go into this new situation half stupid from lack of rest, but the worry only made it worse. I couldn't force myself to sleep. I'd tried. A distraction might help derail the worried thoughts swarming in my head. I pulled out the memory orb from the power plant. I stared at it for a moment, running through a mental checklist. I wasn't in battle, or imminent danger, so it should be safe. On the other hoof, these orbs were always a gamble. I remembered the sickening experience of the damaged memory orb all too vividly. Part of me also wondered if I was just using lack of sleep as an excuse to indulge my curiosity. I probably was. Well, that was okay. Who didn't have their vices? The memory orb held within was something amazing, wondrous, inspiring. Sunlight. Pure, radiant sunlight. Unfiltered and unmolested by a cover of clouds. A ball of fire in the sky was at once terrifying and majestic. The living symbol of the goddess Celestia herself. Its light was powerful, capable of slashing through the darkness and shadows, revealing and cleansing. It was warm and compassionate, and it brought with it a sense of hope and peace. Sunlight was as miraculous to me as my pit buck was to the ponies of the equestrian wasteland, and likewise, it was as pedestrian to the pony I was riding as my pit buck was to me. I was standing on a balcony with several smartly dressed gentle stallions staring down into a huge sunlit foyer lined with clear windows of glass that rose at least three stories high. The scene outside was idyllic. Colorful ponies, dressed finely, went about their business along cobblestone sidewalks bordering a boulevard of grass. A geometrically perfect field of green divided into precision shapes by cobblestone paths and a huge reflective pool. The buildings on the other side were largely obscured by trees, but I could tell they were as regal and impressive as the one I was in. Balconies and mezzanines arced around the airy open atrium. Large gardening boxes held full-grown apple trees, and everywhere ponies moved around busily. After looking about briefly, my host focused on a light-colored marble floor below, where the throng of ponies were causing a disturbance. It was a small mob pressing in towards a single figure in the center, a zebra. Go back where you came from. Did you think you could just trot into a ministry? Better wiped than striped. What are you doing here? Are you a spy? A voice rang out over the crowd as a familiar orange pony with a blonde mane and tail came trotting down an archway stair. Simmer down, Sally. Zakora ain't no spy. Applejack reached the throng and quickly dispersed the ponies, who grumbled as they went back to work. In just over a minute, I was just her standing alone with the extremely out-of-place zebra. Other ponies had given them a wide berth, shooting stares. Applejack shot even better stares back, causing several to shy away, picking up their pace. I thought she turned to the, to the zebra, looking deeply apologetic. Zakora, you really ought not to be walking around like that. It ain't safe these days. I thought I could visit a friend, the zebra replied in an exotic and strangely poetic voice. I should not have known how it would end. Well, there is a war on, Applejack said reasonably. She lifted a hoof to scratch beneath her ears, looking embarrassed. Ponies hate and fear me still, no better than in Ponyville. 
The zebra's voice was deep with disappointment. To you folks, zebra may seem strange, but ponies, ponies never change. Gee, thanks. Applejack frowned, bristled a little. Then she let out a sigh. Well, let's just get you out of sight, okay? Come with me. Applejack paused, looking around the huge atrium. I should have an office in here somewhere. This is her ministry, and she doesn't even know where her own office is? Lady Applejack, how good to... A gentle stallion called out, approaching from a different stairwell. He stopped as he spotted the zebra. Oh my! Ugh, Applejack grimaced, face hoofing. Not you too, Starshine. Ain't nothing wrong with Sakura. She's my friend. Oh, of course, the gentle stallion said gracefully. I have nothing against zebras. In fact, my company is one of the only in Canterlot who make a practice of hiring zebras. Well, wasn't he a smarmery buck? Let the Ministry of Propaganda say what it will. Ministry of Image, Applejack corrected. I believe that's what I said, Starshine stated dismissively, turning his attention fully to the zebra. Anyway, Zakora, is it? Should you ever find yourself looking for work, look me up. Anyone who has Lady Applejack's hoofprint of approval. Was there something you wanted, Starshine? Applejack interrupted impatiently. Oh yes, I just wanted to pass on a little thank you for my... MWT support of our Stellion Grad and Manhattan expansions. Everything's working smoothly, and I expect nothing short of a stellar success. Ah, uh, I told you before, Starshine, we don't take back bucks. Ain't how we operate here. Of course, of course. Banish the thought, the gentle stallion said, in genial apology. No, this is just a friendly gift, but never you mind them. He didn't want to offend, of course. Greasy git. Absolutely everything about this pony was striking a negative note with me. And from the look on her face, Applejack didn't seem much to like him either. Now, Zakora, he said, turning to the zebra woman. How do you feel about public transportation? The stallion standing on the balcony next to me spoke in a quiet voice, drawing my attention away from the scene below. Now she's trotting around publicly announcing friendships with zebras. The publicity alone could sink us. It felt like my host nodded along with the others. Gentle Colts, I think it's time we discussed Applejack's retirement. I came out of the memory, feeling cold. I was appalled by the story of the memory that you only kept for blackmail. I pushed the memory orb far away from me. Steel hooves, I approached the steel ranger cautiously. I want to talk to you about Applejack and her ministry. The helmet of the armor clad ranger turned towards me. He said nothing. You knew her, probably better than anyone else, other than her family and lifelong friends. What? What happened? Mega spells fell. Steel hoof deadpanned. Every pony died. I sighed. He was going to be that way about it. I tried again. What happened between her and the Ministry of Technology? Are you ordering me to tell you? He asked strangely. No, I said, the question made me feel awkward. I'm asking you. I just... I wanted to know. Because you know it will be tactically advantageous to have that information? I hung my head in exasperation. No, because... I stopped, unsure. Because, as dumb as it probably sounds, I care. My words surprised me as did the truth behind them. Somehow, I'd actually come to care for this group of six ponies from 200 years ago, 
the Ministry Mayors. I didn't understand why. It made no sense. But at some point, my glimpse into the past had evolved from mere academic curiosity to a genuine feeling of attachment. Maybe it was meeting Spike, hearing his stories of a bright and joyous past, and the adventures of those close friends certainly sealed the transformation. Part of me wanted a happy ending for at least one of them. Reality painted the chance of that as heart-wrenchingly blink. Bleak. I knew that, but I wasn't willing to stop hoping anyway. Looking past steel hooves, I took in the night-shrouded equestrian wasteland. The low clouds over Philadelphia glowing a dark red, reflecting the lights from below. Hell. We were literally going into hell. A low rumble of steel hooves' voice startled me. Applejack had no taste for being an administrator, he began. I turned towards the ghoul pony, who had, I was certain, once been Applejack's lover. It wasn't like running a farm or organization like the winter wrap-up. I heard the snort of laughter from inside his helmet, which, come to think of it, she needed Twilight Sparkle's help for anyway. So she just hired a whole bunch of business ponies to do it for her. I wondered how many of those I just shared a balcony with. Applejack's intention, still continued, with a touch of uncharacteristically uncharist nostalgia, was for the Ministry of Technology to help encourage and subsidize enterprises that were pushing greater technological and industrial advancement. The Ministry promoted the principles of the Earth Pony Way and sought to help make Equestria better for all ponies through that ethic. Steelhoofs was looking at the horizon, at Philadelphia. His voice held firm, but I could tell this was an emotional thing for the ghoul pony to talk about. I listened, reverently, knowing that this was a gift. Applejack didn't want to stick her hooves into other ponies' businesses, any more than she wanted any pony to mess around with her farm. She believed in the inherently good nature of ponies, and felt they should be left to the guidance of their own virtues. He turned to me suddenly, a note of bitterness creeping into his voice. The problem is, industries and corporations aren't ponies. They don't have a good nature. They're like mainframes, calculating risk and profit. And if the numbers are strong enough, they'd throw baby fillies into the gears of their own machinery to grease the flow of capital. I suddenly found myself thinking of the Crusader mainframe in Stable 29. When Applejack returned to the Ministry of Technology after the death of her brother, her only intention was to focus the efforts of her ministry for as long as it took to create a new, better suit of armor. One that would not fail to protect a pony like Big Macintosh's armor had failed to save him. But the longer she stayed, the deeper the pit of horrors she began to just uncover. What wasn't corrupt was out of control. And so she tried to fix things. Tried to put bit and reins on development. Regulate corporate misconduct. Steelhus fell silent, staring at me for a long time. I felt he was assessing my understanding, and perhaps, with it, my worthiness of this gift. Finally, he finished by adding, and that's not something any pony was going to be happy about, and that some ponies wouldn't stand for. Do you know what word I hate more than any other? Slave. Yes, we are all bound by the chains of industry, but even more. There is a greater chain that holds us together. It is the chain of mutual responsibility. And to break free of that chain is to become nothing better than a raider, the most loathsome and repugnant sort of leech on our great Equestria. Ah, if I am a slave, because I am not independent of virtue and accountability to my fellow pony, then I do not want freedom. 
the freedom to be worthless, destructive, unproductive. License to abandon the future that only together we may achieve. This is not liberty. It is anarchy at its most vile. And the good, hard-working, and honorable ponies of Equestria will not stand for it. Will you? Raiders are the epitome of the sins of the past. Selfish, lazy, greedy. They take what they cannot build for themselves, and they destroy what they cannot take. They infest the equestrian wasteland like termites, chewing away at the already frail bones of our once great nation. They even skitter about in the ruins of Philadelphia, chittering just outside the wall. Rest assured, my little ponies, that when the rebirth comes, there will be no room for such harmful and parasitical insects in our new world. Those who do not join the unity will be crushed under our hooves, stamped out once and for all. We may not even have to wait that short time. Even today, the glorious army of the children of unity grows stronger, mightier, and the goddess herself, herself sends out her children, created in her image, to scour the wasteland. Yes, to those of you out there who are termites, to the raiders, the steel rangers, and the cannibals, I have this to say. The purge is coming. Footnote. Level up. Skills note. Lockpicking has reached 100%. New perk. Clever Prancer. Through agility and reflexes, you have become daft at striking where it hurts, while preventing your enemies from doing the same. You gain an additional 5% chance to score a critical hit. Your enemies suffer a 25% penalty to their chance to critically hit you. This perk is only effective when wearing light or no armor. <laughs>